it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's distinguished guest lecturer, Dr. William Yang, RSI class of 85, and currently a professor at the Center for Neurobehavioral Genetics at the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior at UCLA. Dr. Yang spent his undergraduate years at Yale University, later completing his PhD from uh, Rockefeller University and his MD at uh, Weill Medical College of Cornell University. He is a recipient of Brain of the Brain Disorder Award from the McKnight Foundation, a 2014 NIH Brain Initiative Award, and serves on the Scientific Advisory Board for the Hereditary Disease Foundation. Dr. Yang established his lab at UCLA in 2002. The X. William Yang Research Group focuses on the use of transgenic bacterial artificial chromosomes to model diseases like Huntington's and Parkinson's, applying these models to understanding uh, disease mechanisms and identifying therapeutic targets. The lab's other research focuses include uh, developing tools to study neuronal gene expression and deciphering in vivo protein interaction networks, as well as identifying the role of basal ganglia circuitry in behavior. Please join me in giving a warm RSI welcome to Dr. William. Thank you uh, for that really nice introduction. So it's a real pleasure to give uh, this uh, uh, lecture to all of you. And I know this is a really uh, especially challenging year for everyone. And also, I'm just really, um, I think, uh, grateful that RSI decided to actually carry on this uh, incredible tradition of uh, R this uh, you know, RSI program since started since 1984. And I hope you, all of you, even though this is done virtually online, will have a great research experience and uh, learn as much as uh, many, many of us uh, did when we were at RSI. So what I'm trying to convey you here is uh, the way that we try to study brain disease. Okay, so uh, the, the, you know, the, um, the advent of human genetics is remarkable over the last uh, uh, two decades. So there are many, many genetic variants, either causal disease genes or risk genes or protective genes being identified for many human disease and many of them are, many of them are brain disorders. And the goal actually to identify genetic variants that influence the risk of disease is to develop therapy, right? There are so many patients there want to see how scientists can take those genetic revolution and actually develop it into new therapy that change their life or their loved one's life. And the challenge here is the two pound tissue in the middle, the human brain. It is so difficult to study human brain, period. We'll, we'll tell, I'll explain to you why. And also it's difficult to study human brain over time. Right? A lot of this disease did not happen at day zero, it happened, or whatever the day that the baby is born, it happened over decades, or it could be lifelong. So that is very difficult, right? Nobody's going to donate a single cell to anybody else to study their brain. So, so we really, you know, can only study the brain at the, when patient died, the postmortem brain, which could be decades of, of, with the decades of disease. So the modern, you know, neuroscience allow us actually to take a different strategy, which is what we're taking in our lab which is that the human and the mouse, you know, all the mammals, the genetics are very similar, okay? So we all have a three billion base pair DNA and um, actually um, it's very, very easy to introduce genetic mutations on the gene that's similar between human mouse into a mouse, okay? As a matter of fact, the nature cover there is the cloning, the cl sequencing of the mouse genome is actually a composite, it's a mosaic of, of a many, many human faces. Basically, the idea here is that once you clone the mouse genome, sequence the mouse genome, we can actually use that to study every, every gene that's similar between mouse and human and try to understand our own biology, right, which we care a lot about. And um, what we'll show you here is not just, you know, making mouse models, okay? And traditionally, you, what we do is we introduce the genetic mutation into mouse. We go straight to the lower right, which is, you know, animal behavior, weighing the brain, counting the cells, so-called preclinical study. But many of you probably heard about when you do this kind of preclinical study, uh, just because the readout is very poor, and uh, often, you know, you do a drug testing in one mouse model of disease, like ALS model, and then it doesn't work in, the, in another lab or doesn't work in the patients. So nowadays, what we're doing in my lab is actually we try to uh, leverage the, the large-scale, um, you know, analysis we can do today. Okay, these so-called omics, right? We could do transcriptomics, proteomics, all these omics molecular study. But also, so this is the triangle, which I try to illustrate there. We can build a molecular network uh, in, when we're phenotyping these mice. But uh, today, what I really want to tell you is also another tool. 
So, so these are two topics I want to show you. One is how we do modeling. The other is I want to show you another new tool that we developed in our lab, yet unpublished uh, through our brain initiative work. We actually have a brand new way to study the brain cell biology at a big scale, at a big data level. Why we want to do that? Because there's a high information content, because it's all mixed, and it will give us high reproducibility, okay, because the big data and, you know, the much stronger statistics, and also allow higher, much higher throughput study in vivo to study disease mechanism and also to test the therapeutics. So just want to go back to, you know, this is something I think all of, all of us can marvel, even those of you who are mathematicians and physicists, because you're so smart, and we you guys also smart. And it's because this, because your brain, okay? And on one side is the actual brain tissue, on the other side is the image of how, at least in human, roughly we can map how the brains are connected. The brain is so complex because we have, I believe this is what we know, about 67 billion neurons. Okay, neurons are the ones that are connecting and communicating with other cells, but they also have a lot of cells uh, we call glial cells. In a way, sometimes people call them supporting cells, but they actually have important function you know, on their own right. So, so, but then, you know, we, right now, we don't even know how many different types of neurons in the brain, okay? We, we think, the scientists think, maybe there are hundreds to thousands of types. As a matter of fact, uh, as a, matter of fact a big part of uh, this uh, brain initiative cell type classification consortium, which is actually the biggest part of the investment for brain initiative, uh, and I'm part of that. And um, we're trying to figure out how many types of neurons in the mouse brain and the human brain. So then, you know, with the 67 billion neurons, each one of them have on average 7,000 to maybe 100,000 connections with other neurons, okay? And uh, there are about total 100 to 500 trillion connections in the human brain. And then in addition to that, each neuron is alive. It's endowed with the whole genome come, you know, one copy from mom, one copy from dad, about 6.3 billion base pairs of, of genetic encoded information. It encodes about 21,000 proteins that may be you know, tens of thousands of non-coding RNAs. These are all important uh, machineries that help our brain cell function. So, so imagine, okay, each brain cell is most likely more complex than the most complex computer we have today, okay? And then we have 67 billion of them. They're all alive and they're talking to each other. That is the complexity we try to understand. So, um, the, you know, the, the past uh, decade, uh, the brain science is really advancing. I think after the Genome Project, the biggest, one of the biggest science projects is actually President Obama's Brain Initiative. We really try to understand how the brain works in a way to help better understand ourselves, but also have a more technology to, you know, study how the brain works as a, you know, uh, to do its computation, but also to treat the brain disease. So I can tell you that with all these new technology we're having, we can now map about 1,000 neurons connection in a mouse brain. Okay, mouse has about 100 million neurons. We can map about 100 or 1,000 neurons. This take like a, a big institute, this Howard Hughes Institute, a couple of years to do, okay? On the left side is the axonal projection of about 1,000 neurons. These are the outputs. On the right is another study show each neuron has about 7,000 inputs. Okay, the, go, the, the, the one on the left are the excitatory input, make the neuron more active. On the right are the inhibitory input, make the neuron more silencing. So the neurons are all talking to each other through these tens of thousands of inputs, and, um, and they're all there, they're functioning, working. But right now, we you know, cannot really study them at the scale that we would like. Okay, so I want to pose this as a, as a challenge, and I want all of you who are biologists or all of you who are computer, aspiring computer scientists, to think about how we could actually work with each other back and forth to understand how this works and perhaps build a better computer. So for me, um, I'm really interested in brain disease. So you can imagine everything I told you, all that complexity, any one component doesn't work could be a human disease. If it doesn't kill you at the birth, then you eventually become a human disease of the brain, okay? So some of the common disease you can hear about, um, which is arbitrarily divided into neurological and psychiatric disease. Uh, this including neurodegenerative disease, which we're gonna talk a lot about, Alzheimer, Parkinson, Huntington, ALS, uh, their movement disorders, uh, Tourette syndrome, epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, stroke, TBI, infections. On the right side, you have a very common psychiatric disease from depression, schizophrenia, bipolar, autism, et cetera. And drug addiction, of course. Actually, everything in red here are something that we're studying in our, our lab, okay? In one type of project or another. 
So if any of you are interested in particular one of them, I'll be happy to talk more with you. So we're going to focus on neurodegenerative disease. So right now we're in one pandemic, but it's actually there's another pandemic are, are basically um, for sure will happen. Okay, it's, it's, it's called dementia or age dependent neurodegenerative disease. So if you look at the graph there, it's plotting the number of cases for people with just Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common form of dementia in the next uh, you know, uh, uh, 30 years. And um, right now there's 36 million people around the world, about 6 million in the US. And the number is gonna double every 20 years. So it's gonna be like 66 million by 2030. Really sadly, you know, right now you need about three people to take care of one dementia patients, just because you have to, a lot of them need to be taken care of around the clock. So if you look at the cost, it's about 1% of the global GDP right now is devoted to for, for, for actually uh, taking care of dementia patients. In the US, that's about $260 billion. But uh, I think that's a typo. I think by 2030, it's going to be cost about one, more than one trillion. That would be more than the defense cost of the United States. So that is a big, you know, big cost. And mo most uh, importantly, there's no effective treatment that can prevent or change the course of any of these neurodegenerative disease right now. So we're spending all this money and the patient is actually not doing better. So just to reiterate, um, so there are these different neurodegenerative disease and I'm listing the number of patients, the number two is Parkinson, about a million in the US. You heard of frontal temporal dementia, ALS actually, uh, it's not that many, but the patient died relatively quickly. So there's a high incidence rate. And uh, we're going to talk about Huntington disease, which is the main topic today. It's about 30,000 in the US, 75,000 in the Euro uh, North America and Europe, at least another 30,000 uh, in the Asia and around the world. So I'm going to show, tell you that the, the, this neurodegenerative disease or this age-dependent neurodegenerative disease has some common features. Okay, that's why people kind of group them together. Number one is that they're neurodegenerative. So the, the brain actually shrink. There's a volume loss. You look at the, the picture on the left is uh, a healthy uh, postmortem brain on the healthy. It's a postmortem brain don't have neurodegenerative disease. On the right is actually the shrinkage you see in Alzheimer's disease. And you can see the neuron die gradually. Okay, you, have, you see a healthy neuron on the left, but then you see the shrinked neuron on the right. But you know, even you lose like five branches, the neuron's probably not working well, okay? And then the second feature is that for all these disease, different disease seem to accumulate different type protein. They form these clumps we call aggregates. And often these, 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 the, the components of the protein aggregates are somehow related to the cause of the disease, okay? So in Alzheimer's disease, for example, there's this amyloid beta plaque and amyloid, amyloid protein mutation can cause Alzheimer's disease. They also have a tau, you know, uh, this neurofibrillary tangle, this tau tangle, and that's also related to Alzheimer's disease. In Parkinson's disease, for example, they have this Lewy body formed by alpha synuclein, and the synuclein is also uh, related to Alzheimer's disease. So, so, so right now I can tell you, you know, people sometimes say, oh, it's easy. There's an aggregate, these are sort of a, a, you know, garbage that cannot be cleared. And if we clear them, you know, the disease will be here. That is still a train of thoughts in, 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 the, in, the, in the field, but right now I think there are also data suggesting some of these aggregates may be actually good. They may be actually putting all the bad things in the garbage can is better than having the garbage all over the room. So, so, but, so whether these aggregates are neutral, good or bad, um, and uh, it's not clear, okay? That's yet to be answered. The third thing is actually inflammation in the brain. Okay, for the longest time, so their brain has these glia cells, especially these uh, immune cells called the microglia. So for the longest time, people think, oh, these are secondary because you have neuron die and then the glia cell has to react. So, this is, so that we don't study them because they're downstream. But no, but recent genetic study in Alzheimer's disease revealed that actually dozens of genes, okay, change risk of Alzheimer's disease. Some of them increase risk, some of them decrease risk. Their genes actually only express in the microglia. So now the microglia become front and center in, uh, in, in actually therapeutic discovery for Alzheimer's disease. I'm not gonna talk about this this time, but I did actually give a talk. I think there's a video at the CE website about our work on Alzheimer's disease. So for those who are interested, you can take a look. So next thing I wanna tell you is that it's also a very fascinating aspect about this disease is that it's the time, okay? That these patients with Alzheimer, I mean, I think all of you have some relative with Alzheimer or Parkinson, hopefully, you know, not many with Huntington. Um, 
you know that they, they are completely healthy and normal and functional until they're well into their 60s and 70s, right? Then they become have a dementia. So the question is, what is aging to do with this? As a matter of fact, aging itself now is, can be biologically studied. Okay, my colleague Steve Horvath developed this epigenetic clock. So you can actually study aging in human or in any species using this really accurate biological clock of aging. And then you can start thinking about how can we you know, perturb that process. So I can tell you the trend, the way of thinking right now is for this disease is we can either try to do prevention by treating the disease etiology, the causes, which is you know, the rest of my talk. But we can also maybe delay the aging process. Okay, if we can make your brain always look like they're 45, you're not going to get disease when they're 65. And also, I'm not saying that's impossible. Okay, I want those of you to think about it because maybe one of you actually will join the effort that Steve Horvath and us are working on, start working on now about aging. Um, but also disease modification. So once you have some disease, right, it still takes about five to 10, sometimes 20 years for a patient to deteriorate and die. So we also try to actively work on therapy that can change the progression of the disease after onset. So I won't go into detail here, but why we, I talk about these disease, you know, you know, instead of some of these psychiatric disease, is that for these neurodegenerative disease, there are clear cut disease causal genes and risk genes. So the human genetic really yield uh, incredible clues on, on the genetic basis of this disease. So they give us a really good starting point to try to understand the whole course of the disease, which is called the pathogenesis, and you know, also to develop therapeutics. Okay, so as I mentioned, today we're going to focus on Huntington disease. I'm going to move on. So Huntington disease, uh, also known as HD, is monogenic. It's a dominant inheritance, and it's 100% penetrant. So if you look at this graph on the lower right here, it shows that it's a dominant genetic disease. So uh, you, only one parent have the disease will give to 50% of the children and then the disease never skip a generation, okay? So, so which, which really means that you, if you have a one disease allele, so you have a two sets of chromosome, one from mom, one from dad, so you have one set of the chromosome, either from mom or dad, has the HD gene, then you, you know, you have 50-50 chance, and then if you are diagnosed with having the HD gene, your children has 50-50 chance. So I already told you there are about 75,000 in North America and Europe, and there are about 225,000 at the risk of inheriting the HD gene. And average age onset of HD is around 40s, okay, 40s to 50s, but it can be ranging from two years old all the way to 85 year old. I will explain to you why. And the clinically hunting disease characterized by movement disorder, which, you know, especially this uh, dance-like movement, I'll show you a video, it's called chorea, but also this movement where they're, they're very rigid, it's called dystonia, and the patient often has gait problem, and also actually really impair patient's function, including cognitive deficits, deficits and psychiatric deficits, especially uh, depression. There's a very high suicide rate among Huntington patients. And once the symptom onset, there's a relentless progression. Okay, the patient from really high functioning to eventually bedridden, you know, couldn't eat, couldn't talk in about 20 years. They die about in about 20 years. And also there's no disease modifying therapy. So I'm gonna show you a video. Let's hope, finger crossed, it's not gonna crash, okay? So this is actually a video of a Huntington disease patient in Venezuela, where near this Lake Maracaibo, there's large, large Huntington uh, families, you know, about more than 10,000 patients there. And as you can see, the patient has this dance-like movement, also has this dystonia. This is not a patient living in a really poor part of the, Venus, uh, the uh, Maracaibo, and uh, she has a you know, really severe symptom, and she tried to cross this bridge, and she couldn't do it, so she fell. Okay, so this is a video I got from uh, Dr. Nancy Wexler, and I'll explain to you. Okay, before that, that I, want, I, I want another thing I want to mention to you is that the Huntington disease is actually due to neurodegeneration. So the neuron that degenerate, the neuron that lost in Huntington disease is mostly in this region uh, called the caudiputamen in human. In the mouse, we call striatum. So this is labeled striatum here, but just remember that's called caudiputamen putamen in human. And also in the cortex, these are the you know, gyrate part of the brain that's uh, you know, involve our cognition, thinking, whatever. So, so if you look on the right, the, 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 the normal, quote unquote, normal brain, the, the striatum is there. There are a lot of cells there. The cortex is healthy. On the left, most of the neurons in the striatum is gone and the cortex become thinning. There's some neuronal loss in the deep layer of the cortex. 
So on the right is the neuron that died in Huntington disease in the stride. It's called a medium spiny neuron. It constitutes about 90% of the neurons in the stride. That's what they look like. So I can tell you a lot of the neuroscientists interested in Huntington disease because they're interested in why certain neurons die, especially the interest in medium spiny neurons, you know, just a big focus in the field of neuroscience. So they're interested in why medium spiny neurons die, which is also an important question, right? This is a selective neuronal vulnerability. So the Huntington happened to target uh, one of the most important circuitry in vertebrates, okay? This is so-called the cortical basal ganglia circuitry. So these two regions are connected. The cortex project to the basal ganglia, and then the basal ganglia project through this uh, circuitry back to the cortex. So this so-called cortical uh, basal ganglia loop is involved in some of the most important functions we have, okay? Including motor control, motor learning, habit formation. Remember, we're all, you know, uh, you know have the creature of habits. So this habit formation is very important for us. Uh, skill and the reward-based learning, and also cognition, decision-making, language, social interaction, and emotion. So these are the functions attributed to different parts of the cortical basal ganglia circuitry. And the dysfunction of the circuitry is being implicated in all these disorders I listed here, okay? From Huntington, Parkinson, Tourette syndrome, to uh, drug addiction, schizophrenia, autism, OCD. So this is a really important circuitry if you're interested in brain disease. So as I mentioned, you know, uh, the discovery of the HD gene is really I think a heroic, uh, uh, you, know, you know, just a pioneering work done, uh, led by Dr. Nancy Wexler uh, in Venezuela. This is over 20 years. This is from the late 70s all the way to early 2000. And um, she, Dr. Wexler actually recently disclosed that she actually has the HD gene. Her mom had a Huntington disease. And for the longest time, she's the leader. She basically founded the field, she and her father. And uh, she, we did not know she had HD gene or not. We may have some hunch. We all wish she did not have it. But recently, I think, I think she, uh, you know, bravely told the world uh, through a New York Times article and also through a Ken Burns a special documentary, uh, which called The Gene, which I highly, highly recommend all of you can watch at the PBS website uh, about, you know, her, you know, how she found Huntington gene and how, you know, she viewed her own Huntington disease. And um, also for those who are interested in the history of uh, finding a gene in Huntington disease, I, I recommend Alice Wechler's book, Mapping Fate. So the discovery of Huntington disease gene is actually really landmark in human genetics because it's the first time one can actually use a genetic marker to identify where the location of disease gene is without any other knowledge. And that discovery helped uh, uh, propel the, the human genome project. So, I mentioned this because it's really personally very important to me, uh, to my career. Um, so I was fresh out of MD PhD and tried to look for a deep brain disease to do research on. And uh, Dr. Wexler invited me to, uh, I also just finished my MD, and Dr. Wexler invited me to Venezuela uh, twice. And uh, I saw so many Huntington patients, where many of them actually are kids uh, who potentially has the HD gene. And it really made me, and also a lot of, I met a lot of great scientists work in the field. Uh, it really made me, uh, you know, want to study her HD and then perhaps make a difference to uh, these kids' life. Um, so now back to human genetics. So HD actually, uh, the gene that found by Dr. Wessler and, and uh, her, her team, it found out that HD actually is a mutation on the distal end of chromosome 4, and it's a genetic stutter. What I mean by that is that it's in a large gene they named the Huntington, okay, or HTT, and they turn out the mutation is this CAG, CAG repeat. So CAG, as you know, is the genetic code, right? C, A, and G. But the region of this protein at the very beginning is CAG, 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 okay? And then which encode an amino acid called the glutamine or Q. So, so if you look at DNA RNA level, it's a CAG, CAG, CAG. And if you look at the protein level, it's Q, or we sometimes refer to as polyglutamine or poly Q, okay? Just to make sure you know the nomenclature. And in, in the non-HD individual, in most of us or all of us, the repeat is less, is 35 or less. Usually it's less than 20, okay? But in those with the, with, with the Huntington disease, is 36 or above, okay? 36 to 40, sometimes they have HD, sometimes don't, but above 40, for sure they have Huntington disease. But the repeat can be as long as, you know, greater than 120. There, I think the longest one discovered is about 180 in human beings. So that actually is meaningful. 
the longer the CAG repeat, the early the age of onset of the disease. So this is really a, a very iconic curve. It's called the inverse relationship between the repeat length of the Huntington and age of disease onset. So it means that actually that repeat really is meaningful. It's really relevant to the disease. Okay, just to keep that in mind. So, um, so you can say, hi, where we know the mutation, you know, which is found in 1993. We should already, you know, know everything about Huntington disease. Why is it so hard? I'll explain to you why it's so hard. This is a pure genetic disease. It's hard first to start. Huntington is a really big gene. Okay, the gene is about 180,000 base pair of DNA. Okay, and then encode a protein that's about 3,200 amino acid. It's a really large protein. And the protein looks like nothing else on the, in the genome. It has all these, you know, ring-like, you know, this sling-like structure, okay, called the heat repeat, which is essentially like a, like a train has all these cars that can carry cargoes. So we think Huntington is like a big scaffold protein that can interact with different protein under different context. As a matter of fact, we got the first glimpse of what the Huntington looked like on the right with that nature paper, showing the Huntington is like this, lots of loops wrapped around another binding protein called HAP40. So, so, okay, Huntington's protein is large. The second part is, is difficult to understand Huntington disease is the Huntington protein is expressed everywhere all the time. Okay, even ever since one cell stage, you know, you know, from one cell in the embryo, every single stage of every single cell in the body has Huntington. Okay, so mutant Huntington is everywhere. But then it takes about 40 years and only kills, you know, very few, several types of neurons in the brain. So that is a big enigma, right? Why something everywhere is, is a, only killed a you know, certain type of neuron in the brain. The second, the, the third thing is that the Huntington disease is actually essential for survival. So if you completely delete Huntington in the mouse, it never born. If you delete Huntington in the neuron while they're developing, the neurons die. If you delete Huntington in the neuron after the neuron develop, they eventually the neuron die also. But Huntington disease, remember I told you it's only carry one allele. So we don't think it's a loss of function. They're actually a human being missing one copy of Huntington, they're, they're, they do not have Huntington disease. They have some other problem because deletion of the other gene next to them. But they, so, so Huntington is not a loss of function disease. Okay, it's a gain of function disease. The last thing is that what does Huntington do? It's not a simple enzyme, a simple receptor. It's actually, it's a, it, it does like a little bit of everything. You know, it's being implicated in axon transport, vesicle transport, nuclear transcription, autophagy, mitochondrial cell division. It's, it's, I can tell you that every time I go give a talk at some other university, someone said, oh, I work on this and this. I say, ha, huh, there's a paper on Huntington disease with your, your system. So it's Huntington just have such a diverse function, okay? That make it understand the disease very complicated. So, so what I'm trying to tell you so far is that genetically, Huntington, you know, has lots of patients. Genetically, it's very clear cut. Chromosome 4, CAG expansion, immune Huntington. And, and making this toxic protein has lots of cues, lots of glutamines. So on the left side, everything's clear cut. But on the right side is our challenge, right? Why take so long? You know, why take 40 years or 50 years or 80 years? Uh, what makes certain neurons die but other cells survive? Looks fine. And I can tell you the mutant Huntington also form these aggregates. And I, we don't know the aggregates are good, neutral, or bad. I told you earlier. And more importantly, we do not know what caused this devastating uh, clinical symptoms, movement disorder, cognitive psychiatric symptoms. So really, I think a lot of scientists, you know, including, you know, especially myself, really think this actually is a model disease, okay? We actually gonna use Huntington as a model disease to learn how to study disease and how to treat the disease. And whatever we learn in Huntington disease, we can use to study any other brain disease, period. So um, just to tell you why it's uh, difficult to study the pathogenesis of Huntington disease, as I told you, the mutant Huntington is involved in expressing every different cell in the brain, or all the cells in the brain. So one of the first questions I were interested in when I set up my lab at UCLA 2002 is really trying to understand in what cell type mutant Huntington is important for uh, causing the striatal neuron to you know, be sick and also make the cortical neuron sick, but other cells relatively okay, okay? And the second thing is what we really try to understand is the molecular pathogenesis. So even within one sick cell, okay, either in the striatum or cortex, remember I told you there's thousands of proteins and we actually did a study, okay? We did a Huntington interactome study and we found out that in the brain, Huntington combines to about 750 proteins, 
Okay, so the question is how, which one is 750 protein is important, which one is just a byproduct. So it, it's, it's a lot of complexity at the molecular level. So we actually want to sit more systematically study pathogenesis at the cellular circuitry level and more systematically study pathogenesis at the molecular level. And I'll show you some of the uh, sort of study we've done and, and also uh, what are the approaches uh, if we and others are taking. So the approach that we took, okay, back then uh, is that we decided to make Huntington disease mouse model, but we want to do this so-called humanized genetic model. Okay, not, not put the human in the mouse like in the cartoon, but we actually want to do is actually the following. We, okay, so um, I'll explain what it is. Um, so, so before that, I'll mention to you, you can say why mouse model. So as I mentioned to you, the mouse, the genetically are very similar to human. It's about 90% one-to-one -one correspondence in the mouse genes and human genes, and each gene are quite similar. And uh, of course, the, our brain is much bigger than mouse brain, that's without saying, but the type of neurons in the brain and how they're connected and what function they serve are very similar. Okay, so our, the mouse 100 million neuron are doing a lot of the similar circuitry function, the layout uh, as, as, as in human, okay? And importantly, there, there, there are a lot of scientists study the behavior of the rodents. So there's really rich behavior data uh, to, you know, to assay anything wrong with the brain. And uh, also importantly, as you know now, there's just great genetic tools. You can do transgenesis insertion into the mouse. You can do CRISPR to delete energy in the mouse. So it's really the genetic tool in mouse is, is much easy. And one of the most important things is the mouse has a very uh, quick generation time, right? If you study, you know, you, right? If you study non-human primates, for example, there are people who engineer non-human primates, they live 30 years. So, you know, so, so it's very, take a long time for you to study. For the mouse, uh, you know, uh, at about three months of age, they can give, 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 you know, give birth to their next generation. And the litter is really large. Each litter could be anywhere between five and 10 mice, pups. So, so it's really great for genetic study. Oops. Ha, I think it finally freeze. Um, I actually have to go back. Sorry, I need to I need to re re log in.
My apology. Um, let me share my screen with a PDF. I, I think the, I always have an issue with, pa, with a PowerPoint. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to share this. Can you see the PDF? Yes. Uh, okay, I think, I think this should work. Okay, let's finger crossed. Um, I need to be speed up, speed up a little bit. Do you heard me talk about this, right? I hope. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm going to save time and hopefully have time in the end for you guys to ask any questions. Okay, so what we do, so what we decide to do is we, we take these really large piece of human DNA, genomic DNA, okay, it's about 150 to 200 KB, and this uh, a piece of DNA called the bacterial artificial chromosome or BAC, okay? So the BAC is really large and they're from human, and uh, the nice thing with the back is that it has all the bells and whistles, all these you know, regulatory elements, promoter, enhancer, suppressor, splicing regulators, poly A signals, everything that needs for the proper expression of a gene, human gene, in the right cell type, right time in any you know, mouse is all on that piece of DNA, okay? So we, we know that because we actually published a paper, I published a paper in 1997, uh, that's when this technology was invented. I was a graduate student at Rockefeller. And we later, uh, uh, my mentor, Nat Heinz, actually showed this in a really large project. They did develop 2,000 back mice. And they showed that they always express really nicely. And um, so here, you know, we want to use human Huntington. And, and um, so, so what we do is this. We take a human Huntington, really large, 240 KB. And it has all the 170 KB Huntington gene. Huntington gene is really huge has 67 axons. So we engineered it to insert the mutant axon one into the axon one. We put this little, you know, LOXP sites flanking it, uh, which actually will explain again what LOXP is, is this uh, sequence that combined by Cree recombinase, and uh, the Cree can then act like a scissor to cut it out. So we want, want to make this model conditional. At the baseline, express human mutant Huntington should give you disease-like phenotype. But then in any cell express Cree, we can shut down the mutant Huntington expression just in that cell. Okay, I'll show you why that's important. So to, to make these mice, um, so actually the other thing I want to let you know is not only the, the, the gene has a, all the Huntington sequence and all the you know, genomic DNA, very luckily, whoever donated this Huntington back that we end up using, um, some, someone lived in Buffalo, New York, actually happened to have the Huntington disease SNPs, their variants, that actually showed up more in the Huntington patient than control. So this HD associated SNPs also on our back. This end up to be very important when people actually later try to treat Huntington disease using therapy, just lower the, the patient associated Huntington allele. Anyway, so, so just show you how to do this. We routinely do this in our lab. We took one of these back that's already pre-made and uh, it's all in bacteria on the dish. It takes, about, takes us about a month to actually inter introduce the mutation into the human Huntington back. And then we purify the intact back DNA, takes about a you know, few days. And then we send them to inject into the one cell mouse embryo, this is a transgenic core. And then the, in the one cell mouse embryo, the DNA will integrate it into the genome and it will stably integrate it. And um, it will born as a, a transgenic founder. And that will exist once we, you know, we know it's integrated, that transgenic, the human transgene in the, in the mouse will, will be propagated forever, okay? So we made this model in 2002, and now they're still being widely used. So actually, this, is, this work was done by my formal postdoc, Michelle Gray. Now she's at uh, uh, UAB. And um, so we and others, especially Michelle, show this model has a nicely progressive behavior deficit. They have motor coordination problem on the rotor rod. They have hypoactivity, sleep disruption, some anxiety-like behavior, some depression-like behavior. And by the time they're you know, older, like 11 months of age, they start showing aggregation, okay? And they have a shrinkage of the brain in the right region, the striatum and cortex, but not cerebellum. So this has some of the important features of Huntington disease, but it, it doesn't have a real neuronal loss. This is a problem for a lot of the Huntington disease or, or neurodegenerative disease model. They don't have a, a lot of cell loss, but we have to take what we got and um, you know, we study what we, what we can see. But this is an important tool because now we can start asking questions like what happened early on in the disease, you know, let me show you what we're using them for. 
So the first question we asked is uh, actually which region the Huntington expression is more important. Okay, remember I told you Huntington's everywhere, and especially in the striatum and cortex, uh, their, their neurons both degenerate, and the cortical neuron project to the striatum, and then striatum project through this loop back to the cortex. So I bet all of you do, do not understand. This is a very old TV show. Even for me, I never seen it, but I heard about it. It's basically these two guys argue like who's on the first base. Okay, the cortex first base, striato first base. I put it there, but these two guys, you know, killing each other, try to uh, debate who's on the first base. So here we can just say who's on first base. Is it striatum or cortex? So uh, Nan Wang in the lab did this really interesting experiment. She took the back HD mice and she crossed with the Cree mice Okay, that allowed the deletion of the mutant Huntington in back HD, either just in the cortical neurons or just in the striatal neurons, or in both cortical and striatal neuron, but not anywhere else in the brain. And uh, what's really interesting, this is shown on the right side, is that if you just delete mutant Huntington in the striatum, this is called a BR mice, we do not see too much rescue of the symptom. We see some rescue in the electrophysiology in the striatum, but any of these you know, behavior or the atrophy we measure, there's no big change. If we delete immunity Huntington just in the cortex, interestingly, the motor behavior is a little bit improved, significantly improved, but the psychiatry-like behavior is completely normalized, okay? Just like the wild-time mice. And then the atrophy is still not rescued. But importantly, if we delete immunity Huntington in both cortical neuron and striatal neuron, leaving it intact in all the other brain cells and the rest of the body, everything looks like a you know, normal mouse. So this actually is really important, okay, in defining the cellular targets for reducing mutant Huntington to, to actually prevent the disease. So the conclusion, main conclusion is that for the first time, we show the reducing mutant Huntington in the cortex is actually partially rescuing the disease. That before was not thought to be the case. Before think, people think the striatum is the main place to die and everybody in the cortex is like, secondary death, quote unquote, secondary degeneration because their targets are gone. But now we show that actually the cortex play an important role because you delete it, some of the behavior deficits is improving and striatum maybe still play a role, but we don't see big rescue. We see some rescue in the synaptic deficit. But importantly, if you really try to treat mutant uh, HD, you need to reduce mutant Huntington in both brain regions. So that's the main conclusion. So the second thing that we did with this type of model is that we actually identify this uh, uh, molecular switch at the very beginning of mutant Huntington. Um, this uh, 17 amino acid in the very beginning of mutant Huntington, it turned out to be a very interesting region. This is right next to the polycule region. So this region turned out to be a really critical regulator of this polycule aggregation. So this is actually true in test tube, in transfected cells, and we actually show it the first time in the mouse brain. Um, so basically, the, this, this region is regulating the way Huntington aggregate. However, in this region, there's a two serine residue, 13 and 16, that can be decorated with this chemical tag called phosphorylation, which is mediated by an enzyme called the kinase. So once they're phosphorylated, you know, we want to know what happened. So what we, what we basically did is that we generate this different version of Huntington disease mouse model. One version, sorry, this actually used to be a video, but now I don't dare, there's no video, this is a PDF. So, so one version is we mimic phosphorylation, which is shown on the left. It turned out if we mimic phosphorylation, still have 97Q, which is very you know, toxic, but we just change those two to, to mimic phosphorylation. We actually all of a sudden have a mouse model called SD mice that have completely normal behavior, normal motor, normal psychiatric behavior, no aggregates, and uh, there's no brain atrophy. So, so, but that's not the case if we actually uh, make another type of mutation at those two residue okay, to resist phosphorylation. So basically mimic phosphorylation can switch off a very toxic mutant Huntington 97Q related disease, okay? But, but then what we show the next, uh, in the next paper is that we delete completely this domain, this N17 domain. We found out that we actually create a mouse model which much more severe disease. This model actually has a movement disorder. When they get older, they actually spontaneously fall. They have lots and lots of aggregates and they actually have a 40% neuronal loss. So this, these two papers allow us to you know, conclude that this N17 domain is a bidirectional switch. You know, if you switch in one direction, disease get much worse, really look like Huntington. If you switch the other direction, there's actually no disease. So that actually got the field really interested. And uh, over you know, about 10 years, 
uh, there's a study came out uh, by Ray Chuang's lab at the McMaster University. He did a big screen on small molecule that can change the phosphorylation of serine 1316. And he found out actually a very commonly used small molecule called kinetin, which can actually work with this kinase called CK2, actually mediate the phosphorylation of serine 1316. So he, he showed that in, with the mutant Huntington, the serine 1316 is under phosphorylated, which likely increases toxicity and the toxicity is related to damage to DNA. So what he actually showed in the study is if you give a Huntington mouse model kinetin, just put them in the food, and the mouse model do, it does a lot better, okay? So I'm not saying the kinetin is a therapy for Huntington yet, but again, this is using this kind of very original, you know, you know purely curiosity-driven research on brain disease, you can actually lead to molecular target that you can start uh, act on. Um, I'm not going to talk about anything about system biology. This is the big focus in my lab right now is try to use a, a large scale omics, transcriptomics, proteomics, methylomics to really understand the molecular network uh, in, in HD. This is collaborating with our collaborators, especially Steve Horvath and Peter Lanfelder in my lab and uh, Steve Horvath is own lab. And also we actually try to identify the top targets for this network and go back to the mouse model to do target validation. So one of your fellow, uh, you know, uh, Rikois this year, uh, Jay Iyer is actually working uh, on one of the data sets in this and I'll leave some glory for him to explain to you later. So I want, uh, I want to touch upon the therapeutics. So many of you are probably interested to know what, what's advance being made since 1993 on HD therapeutics. So before I talk about therapeutics, I just want to tell you that our field is actually sort of embarrassed of the riches because we have so many different types of Huntington mouse models. But the models that people really talk about a lot is on the lower right. These are so-called full-length Huntington genomic model. So there are two versions, okay? One version is mouse Huntington. So this so-called knocking. You can make the CAG repeat into the mouse Huntington and they have a different length, you know, 50, 90, 111, whatever. It's endogenous Huntington, right location, right level but it's mouse Huntington, okay? The 99% of the, the gene expressed is from mouse. But then the one on the lower right is called human Huntington. These are back HD. Um, there's another one developed by another lab called Yak128. And we actually recently developed a new model called the back CAG. The back CAG is a little bit better than back HD because the repeat coding region is a pure CAG, which turned out to be also important for disease. So, so these models on the right are all human Huntington, human genomic transgene in the mouse, you know, um, and, and um, has all the bells and whistles of human. So that's important because the human and mouse Huntington, uh, at the DNA level, there are many, many differences. But if you look at just protein level, there's still about 270 amino acid difference out of 3,100, and half of them are non-conservative changes, okay? At the DNA level, there are even many, many more changes. So this turned out to be important from a therapeutic angle. What I'm showing here, oh, this is actually, I'm supposed to fly in some of the stuff. So just imagine, okay, it's a little messy, my apology. So what I'm trying to show you here are the therapeutics right now. This is a state of art, you know, circa 2020, is that there are different strategy of therapy, genetic therapy for Huntington is actually being pursued in the industry. So number one, you heard about CRISPR, Cas9, you know, Feng Zhang's uh, great discovery. And especially Feng Zhang, when he discovered CRISPR-Cas9, the one of the first thing he saw there's Huntington disease. You know, he actually called me right away about Huntington disease. Same thing in Jennifer Donner's lab, they're very interesting Huntington disease. So the idea is, can we use this CRISPR to cut out the mutant repeat? You know, can we take advantage of SNP in the patient? So we only cut out the mutant Huntington repeat in the patient, but not the control. Um, so, so that's on the DNA level, you can use CRISPR-Cas9, but as more advanced the therapy is at RNA level. There are these so-called antisense oligonucleotide or ASOs, okay, developed by Ionis and the Roche. That, that is, you know, I'll show you, it's right now is in phase three clinical trial. There's another ASO developed by a company called the Wave that only lower the mutant patient mutant Huntington, but not the control. And then there's another company really innovative called the PTC. They actually develop a small molecule. Interestingly, can induce aberrant splicing of only human Huntington to reduce the Huntington level. So you can potentially give that molecule by mouth. They did that in back HD and they show they can reduce Huntington in the brain. And then there's another two company called Voyager and AstraZeneca. They're actually using virus AAV to deliver this uh, Huntington lowering RNAi, okay, into the brain and they can also lower Huntington. So the idea is that the Huntington 
RNA, you know, the protein is bad and maybe RNA is bad. So by lowering the Huntington level, it, uh, mutant Huntington level or Huntington level, it could be therapeutic. What I'm showing you here is all these companies, that the, their therapy only targets human Huntington, not mouse Huntington. So they actually have been, they all been tested, uh, have been tested in back HD. So uh, just to show you the very first study, this is actually published in 2012 by Don Cleveland's lab, working with uh, IONIS. They showed in back HD, YAC128, the two human Huntington model, where you gave the ASO, you can lower Huntington, human Huntington and improve many aspects of the disease. And what I'm showing on the right upper corner here is that about seven years later, there's a landmark a human trial okay, done in Huntington patients. Uh, this is actually done by Roche. And it shows that in the pa human patient CSF, they can measure how much Huntington is in the CSF. By giving the ASO to the patient, they actually can reduce the Huntington, human Huntington uh, the, in, in the patient CSF. And that actually is now, the Roche is right now in 60 sites around the world, is doing a Huntington lowering clinical trial. This is the most innovative because it's the first time any genetic therapy ever being delivered into the actual human brain. So if this could work, there's many, many genetic disease in the brain can be treated by this kind of approach. So when they actually did a study, Don, Don Cleveland did a study 2012, they, they observed this really interesting effect, which actually I wrote a comment, uh, so accompanied that paper. It's called Huntington Holiday. What it means is that they actually gave the mouse the ASO, this little nucleotide that can, you know, anti-science to the Huntington, which then degrade by RNSH. When they give this little oligonucleotide, only put two weeks in the mouse. And that beneficial effect in the mouse lasted like more than six months, okay? By, 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 you know, one month later, this ASO is no longer in the mouse body, but the Huntington beneficial effect is still lasting. So we, we, we call this Huntington holiday because as a doctor, we sometimes take patient off a drug, we call drug holiday. So we think this is like a holiday from the effect of mutant Huntington. However, let me show you another thing that's important. The way they develop this drug could not go across the blood-brain barrier. So the way to deliver the drug in patients about every month or every other month is actually they have to use a needle to go to the intrathecal space. So this is actually, it's, you probably heard of a spinal tap, right? So this is a reverse of a spinal tap. You inject the drug into this intrathecal space where the CSF is, and then the flow of the CSF will bring the drug into the brain. However, once it gets into the brain, you look at upper right here, it's a study done in non-human primates, i.e. monkey. When, when the CSF flow into the brain, it actually, it flow more into the cortex, okay, and the spinal cord. So your lower Huntington, the red is showing lower Huntington in the cortex and spinal cord in the, in the monkey, but not in the caudate, which is the, the little asterisk there. So the big risk is that Huntington disease is everywhere, you know, Huntington, mutant Huntington everywhere in the body, where you need to lower Huntington to give a benefit. So when, when these company really thinking, should we do this big trial or not? They actually basically told me that the study we've done, you know, uh, in 2014, showing that the cortical lowering of mutant Huntington itself should have some benefit, at least based on our mouse model, was actually one of the big reasons for them to say, okay, let's try this in the patient because there's nothing really to help the patient. So again, this is to tell you that if you really do this kind of study systematically, you can actually inform a decision uh, at the clinical stage. Okay, so we're actually doing a lot of other uh, study right now, um, you know, with other disease models. So this kind of work we learned uh, from Huntington is going to be help us to study Alzheimer, Parkinson, which we're doing in the lab. If I, if, if I may, I'm going to quickly switch to another topic, hopefully not too long, sorry, it took a little time. So I'm going to actually completely switch gear, okay? For, for those of you who stop thinking about disease, but they're linked because I told you we try to understand the brain and also understand the brain when they're sick. So a big challenge for us to study the brain and brain disease models is actually to see the shape of the neurons. As I showed you earlier, right? Human has 86 billion, mouse has 100 million. Each neuron has a, such an intricate shape. Okay, that is, you know, not just the shape, but also the function is more complex than the most, most complex computer we have. So for the longest time, it's very hard for, hard for us to see the shape of even one neuron in the brain. The reason is that all these neurons, there's no hole in the brain. They all, you know, wired around each other. You know, all the processes are kind of wrapped around each other, like the, what I show on the lower left. And what we really want is to, to, to allow the, some of the neurons dark, so only maybe 1% of the neurons light up, 
screen, then we can see everything about that neuron. So, 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 so we want to do this in a way that we can study any type of cells in the brain. So this is actually uh, done with a two brain initiative project done by uh, my former postdoc Matt Veldman and also uh, current scientist uh, Chang Park. It's a paper that's in press. So again, you know, the goal is to understand how many different types of cells in the brain, you know, what's their morphology can help us understand the cell type and cell function. Think about the way the cell shape is actually constrained and confer their function in the neural circuit, right? You cannot do things when you're not connected with them. So, um, and also for those who study brain disease, I, I showed you earlier on the left, you know, even you lose a, new, a single neuron, lose five branches, you know that neuron is sick. But right now, for us to study the mouse, mouse model of disease brain, even they progress to way on the right, all the branches are gone. We still cannot see them, okay? So right now, the way we study the neural degeneration, we actually have to cut the sections, and then we just stain the cell body and use some kind of statistical measure, so-called unbiased theology, to count the new cell body. We just don't care about the branches at all, which is not a good way to study degeneration. As I told you, there's many beautiful genetic tools being developed, including the back transgenic, which I helped to develop, where you can genetically label any type of cell in the brain. Okay, you can label these D1 neurons or D2 neurons or dopamine neurons, you know, beautifully with a green fluorescent protein. However, since these, these neurons are densely packed and their branches overlap with each other, so you cannot see the branch. You just see these basically, you know, shades of green and they're, they're greener cell body, which is not very helpful if you want to study morphology. Um, so I make an analogy to this. This is almost like uh, if you are interested in Amazon forest, one type of tree is dying, okay, randomly dying in the Amazon forest. But Amazon forest has billions of trees, right? So you can study it in two, one or two ways. One is you can take a picture from space, okay, and say, oh, that part of Amazon forest is almost empty. That is really bad, okay, that is too late. Or you can send some botanist, expert botanist parachute into mid middle of Amazon jungle, and the person knows so much about the tree, and he saw he or she saw 30 trees die okay, of one type. He or she said, ah, 30, this type of tree is dying in the whole jungle. But the sample is too small. That's just a little part of the jungle. Ideally, okay, if you can take a picture from the space and you can actually see the tree, the one type of tree die you know, around in the whole jungle, and you can see the tree at the resolution of single branch, trunk, branch, and the tree leaves. Okay? How to do that? Over 100 years ago, uh, the founder of neuroscience, Ramon Cajal, told us the way to do that is actually do sparse labeling. Okay, he used this uh, technique invented by Golgi, it's called Golgi staining, and he's an amazing artist. You just stare under microscope, see everything, and drew it on the, you know, like art. And um, so he actually, using this kind of, lab, you know, drawing of the sparsely labeled uh, neurons, he can actually derive, derive principle about neurons, the building block, they're discontinuous with each other, and there's direction, the information flow from dendrites to axons. So so-called the neuronal principle. However, the Gaudi staining has been, you know, weren't used for 100 years, over 100 years, but it's not very um, uh, compatible with any of the modern molecular tools. We cannot stain for other genes or other, you know, proteins. There are other genetic tools people try to develop to sparsely label neurons. They either really labor intensive, you can label three neurons in a day and you have to learn the special technique, or they're just not scalable. You cannot be used for any different type of cells. So, um, so because of that reason, okay, if you look at the, this uh, website called neuromorpho.org, they archive all the neurons that's ever been reconstructed in the publication. There's this couple, you know, about 30, 40,000 neurons, okay? And this is, you know, uh, we have 100 million in the mouse. So there's only about 30, 40,000 in the history of knowledge of neuronal reconstruction, which is not enough. So we decided to try to come up with a genetic tool, okay, to allow us to study the shape of any brain cells in, in the brain and do so at a very large scale. So the way we did it is we figure out a, a, a genetic trick. So many of you know the nucleotide, right? A, A, G, 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 you know, these nucleotides. So if the nucleotides are identical, either A, G, C, or T, it's called a mononucleotide. And if these mononucleotides are long, repeat, okay, so they, they uh, you know, what we draw here is the translation frame, you know, the three nucleotide encode one amino acid. So they, if we make this mononucleotide that's out of frame, okay, either 3M plus one or 3M plus two in, 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 in the cell, in every cell division, every time the DNA replicate or DNA repair, these repeat are prone to frame shift. 
Okay, they can go from 22 to 21, you know, or 22 to 18. So this repeat frame shift can bring it from 3n plus 1, 3n plus 2 to 3n. Okay, just remember that. Why that's important? If we put it at the C terminal of this uh, a 3n plus 1, 3n plus 2, a, a, a DNA encoding the green fluorescent protein, okay? But if this repeat is out of frame, this GIP is not translated because it's out of frame, okay? They can only translate in the frame of three. So, so, so if it's a 3n plus 1, 3n plus 2, the GIP reporter is not translated, so after there's no green protein, but every once in a while, stochastically, meaning randomly, at the low frequency, the repeat will frame shift every after cell division. Then it will actually go in frame and the GIP will be translated into this beautiful green protein, okay? So then if it translates into green protein in that cell, that cell will turn green. So the idea is this. So we, again, take advantage of the Cree locks. I told you the Cree is a genetic Caesar and there's a thousands of Cree mouse line developed for any, many different brain cell types, okay? So we cross Cree line to a reporter, this, uh, this traditional reporter where they have locks P sites, it will delete this uh, stop sequence and the reporter will be expressed. By using the traditional reporter line, 100% of these Cree defined cells will light up green. Again, that will become the problem. All the neurons will be right on top of each other. You cannot see anything. But for our morph mice, we, we call this mononucleotide repeat frame shift. So then, you know, we use morph. It sounds kind of cool because it sounds like morphology. So in morph mice, okay, we can cross these thousands of Cree lines with our morph mice. And because most of the cells, they repeat all the frame, the, green, the cells are not green. But every once in a while, one to 5% time, just like a Gaucher staining, one to 5% time, increase defined, genetically defined cells, they will light up green, okay? That's the sparse labeling. Does it work or not? Yes, it works beautifully. So, um, so this is actually the best version we have. Um, so, so don't worry about the construct here, just ubiquitous promoter, flocks the stop sequence as a transcriptional switch. We have a C22 here as this uh, more uh, translational switch. And we use this really, really bright reporter called the Spaghetti Monster. Okay, it's super bright because it has a 10V5. And then we put two of them together called Tandem Spaghetti Monster. And we put that on a membrane. It called the fine insulation. So when we put on membrane, it will label all the process. So imagine we have 20 little tech in this Tandem Spaghetti Monster and they're on a membrane and they sparsely lay, express in one to 5% of those neurons defined by Cree. So we cross this with a Cree line that labeled the cortical neuron. You will see one to 5% label. You can see spines, you can see the axons crisscrossing. We cross with another uh, a Cree line in the cerebellum Purkinje cells. This is actually one of Cajal's favorite cell type. Usually you cross with a Cree, the whole cerebellum will be green, but now just 1% is green and they're beautiful. You see like a Christmas tree and we can readily digitally reconstruct it. Next, we show this type of interneuron, this actual interneuron involved in schizophrenia, and uh, they're just really beautiful. You can see the dendrites are these thick green, uh, thick green branches, and these beaded structure are their axons. It's really, um, uh, you know, meticulate. And then, sorry, this is actually a movie I cannot show you. We actually cross this with a Huntington mice. This is a D2 medium spinal neuron in the striatum. Those are the neurons that die the most in Huntington disease. Not only we see the spine, we can see these beautiful axon cables crossing. And this actually is the microglia. I told you the microglia is really important for Alzheimer's disease. And uh, many of the disease risk genes are affecting microglia. So if you look at the red staining here, this is antibody staining microglia. This is what currently the field is using to look at the microglia morphology. Long be the whole, if we cross this with this uh, morph 3, with this uh, CI3, CR1 Cree, we label about 200,000 microglia in the brain to the resolution of every single process. And at the end of the fraud process, it's called end of feet. Before people cannot see end of feet unless they do EM. And we can see the diversity of morphology because in different brain regions, the shape are different. You see the microglia in the cerebellum, it looks quite different. This is another type of glia cell called the astrocytes. Uh, so when we cross this astro, astrocytes are actually really membranous. So you can see this is almost like a haze. But then in cerebellum, the astrocytes actually is, is a columnar shape. Okay, again, we capture several hundred thousand of these that you can study. Here, the red staining is actually the, the unlabeled astrocytes. Okay, here, the, the red staining is the unlabeled microglia. So you can imagine if everything's labeled, there will be just a sea of green. So we actually apply this to study something that people cannot study before. This is a developing retina in the eye. 
is this beautiful type of cell called the horizontal cells, which actually has one side of dendrite, a very long stalk, and another side of axon. It's involved in kind of sharpening the image in a very uh, bright or very dark place. And uh, before, people can only study this when the mice have become old, because they have to inject the dye into the neuron, and hopefully the whole cell is labeled. So you can spend all day label maybe two neurons. They cannot study them during development. So we actually study this at the postnatal day five during development. In each retina shown on the left, we label about 100 of these, okay? And they label everything. So we can actually use morphology to classify these uh, developing neurons, and we can actually uh, define new horizontal developmental cell type where they have these two weird axons. So this is just a sort of tip of the iceberg what you can do with it. Um, so just let you know the labeling frequency for all the CRE we tested is about one to five percent. Average is about two, two to three percent, which is exactly like a Golgi staining, except now it's genetic. You can do, you know, double staining, you can look at RNA, you can look at protein. So it's really, uh, and very easy just by a single cross. Uh, unfortunately, this is actually also a movie. If I can, I'll go back and try to show you the movie, okay? And uh, this actually to show you, we, we, neurons are three dimensional, right? So all the data I showed you before archive in the database, there are 200 micrometers thick section. But neuron is actually at least 300 to 400 micrometer in, in all dimension. So all the neuron before people reconstructed are partial. So we now develop two ways where we can study neuron in true 3D. One is actually we cut a 500 micrometer section, okay? And then we completely clear it, clear the section to transparent with, with this method called iDisco. And then we have a microscope that can scan through 500 micrometer, and then we can scan through the whole brain. So in each, each uh, study, we have uh, several terabytes worth of data. And then um, this is another method, which we collaborate with Kuan Hong Chang's lab at MIT. So now we actually bought his whole system, where we can Kuan Hong develop this really amazing, amazing method, where he can completely clear the brain. Okay, and then after completely clear the brain, this is all using machines. So we bought two of the machines. Okay, he has all these cool names like Shield and Flash. I think he's really into Marvel comic. So, and then after I saw met him, I, I started watching his Marvel Marvel comic. It's really, you know, I guess fun way to waste your time. But, but these are all, you know, really amazing, can completely clear half the brain. And then we use a microscope in, in a day, one day, we can scan through the whole brain. So we're gonna have several terabytes of data, thousands of neuron labels in three dimension. And you can just imagine how much information that is. So lastly, just get the image is not enough. You, can, you need to actually study the information. So to do that, we actually team up with a, a true a brain a connectomic scientist called Hong Wei Dong. He actually just moved from USC to UCLA, a great move. Um, and also Jason Tong, who's our former computer science chairman. Um, so we basically are developing a pipeline, okay, where we can take the image, the raw image, really large file to actually um, using, you know, some uh, uh, convolution network, neural network to identify the individual components of the cell and then automatically reconstruct these neurons. Uh, Jason's lab is actually doing acceleration, both the software and hardware acceleration, so that can be done in real time. Um, right now, we can actually reconstruct about um, um, 3,000 neurons in a week, but we hopefully to do that more, faster. And uh, just to tell you the scale changes, so before our study, okay, someone published a paper on morphology, this is after several years of work, they probably have like 100 neurons, okay, that's after several years of work. Now, in one of our mouse brain, okay, maybe with, uh, you know, uh, two to three weeks of imaging, staining imaging and reconstruction, we can have 3,000 neurons in the striatum, we can have several thousand neurons in the cortex, uh, we can have 200,000, uh, sorry, 3,000 Purkinje cells, and we can have actually uh, 370,000 microglia. So this is just the orders of magnitude bigger study morphology, both in the normal brain, in development, in aging, and in diseases. So we actually, I like to call this morpholome. For those who are interested, I told you we're part of the Brain uh, Initiative Cell Type Classification Consortium, or BICCN, and some of the data is available there. Um, okay, that is really my talk. Um, I will skip the summary, except to acknowledge the people uh, so this is uh, a nun, is uh, did all the, you know, a lot of the Huntington work, Michelle Gray made the model, and uh, Xiaofeng built some of the new model, and Chris and Matt did the MORPH study. These are my collaborators, and these are my funding agencies, especially NIH, Green Initiative, uh, CHDI, HDF, and also I really want to acknowledge uh, the generosity and support 
uh, to us from uh, HD uh, patient families. Um, you know what, if possible, let me see if I can dare to not, not freeze uh, and <laughs> see if I can show you at least one or two of the video, it's really cool. I'll show you just two videos. So one is this video where, um, where we zoom in. Okay, this is 500 micrometer section, completely cleared. And you zoom in and you see individual medium spiny neuron in true three dimension. Okay. Professor so Yang. Stop. Yeah. I think you have I think you have to change the application you're sharing because we're still seeing the PDF. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That's why it's not the it's not crashed. Okay, I'm joking. Can you see it now? Yep. You see it now? Okay. Now you see the 3D. I'm not going to explain anymore. You can just see it. Explain for yourself. So this is the 500 micrometer. Yeah. 3D medium spiny neuron. Okay. And then I want to show, imagine that we can do this for 300,000. So this is the next one. This is the half a brain completely cleared with a machine and then imaged under uh, this light sheet micros, micros, microscopy half brain image in the one or two days. And this actually won the first ever uh, brain initiative uh, video context. Okay, so for those of you interested in information, informatics, um, machine learning, you know, data processing, this is the next big data. Okay, there's a huge amount of data about neuronal morphology, neuronal connectomics, and how that actually uh, become knowledge of how the brain works. I think it's the big challenge for uh, many fields. Okay, um, I think that's it. Um, I, I, I will stop sharing uh, and uh, I can ask some, answer some questions. Actually, there's maybe, sorry, there may be one. I did make one slide I probably should share because it has a, Maybe people can start asking questions. If people have questions. Do people have questions? Is everybody lost? Um, thank you for your talk. I found it very interesting. I was wondering, I have always been wondering, like, it's quite relevant for us teenagers, um, but what is, like, the science, the neuroscience um, behind sleep? Ah, that's a great question. Um, not related to my talk directly, but it's still a good question. Um, so it depends on what you mean. Is it neuroscience related to sleep in terms of the mechanism regulating sleep or why we need to sleep. There are many different aspects, you know, what, which aspect you're interested? Like why we need it. And like, is like the underlying biology of why it's important? Uh, underlying biology is one thing. Okay. Why it's important is again, there are many different. Ways. So let me tell you. So, so the question of a, a so-called circadian rhythm is very well understood. As, as a matter of fact, there's several years ago, there three Nobel prize were given you know, to the, to the people study uh, circadian rhythm in the fly. And the same molecular machinery turn out to work in our body. So their region, there's one part of the brain called the uh, SC and suprachiasmatic nucleus, which actually is regulating the rhythm in the whole body. Okay. And then there, but, but the rhythm is also entrained by light because the reason, the reason we actually are a rhythmic, one of the big reasons is because of the sun. Right, so the sun came up in a very regular, you know, pattern, and then the, the whole body, animal body, is actually organized towards the, the time of the sun. So either you are, you know, um, diurnal like us, we wake up during daytime to do things, or nocturnal like the mouse. So so you, the whole thing is organized towards that. So that actually, and also your your metabolism, right? The time you eat, for example. So so the idea here is there's a very core, there's a core 
molecular machinery regulating the time people sleep and go up, wake up. Okay, so there's also this interesting mutation identified in human to make certain people only like a sleep, they have to sleep a few, few hours earlier. So these are the early sleepers, they sleep like eight o'clock and wake up 4 a.m. Okay, there's this really interesting mutation, okay, um, that identified by, you know, several scientists in the UCSF. Um, so, so long story short, the mechanism regulating the circadian rhythm and regulating sleep is actually really well understood. Why we need it is a whole other question. You know, so, so there, there's some evidence, I mean, it's actually a very recent study. I'm not sure, you know, how well accepted yet. The long story short is that the, 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 the brain or the body actually um, allocate what you need, what you need, what, what, what the body needed based on the, the time of the day, okay? So, so we actually, again, I did not want to review all this, but we've done this and we have this beautiful result. I'm writing this up right now, basically showing that if you look at the way the brain gene expression is organized, so, so the brain, there's, you know, we, we've done hundreds of RNA-seq of just one brain region, look at the word gene expression organized, and it turned out that some of the gene expression is organized based on cell type, that's what people know before, but a lot of them is based on what we call this diurnal-based transcription, okay? And if you look at diurnal-based transcription, some other people also have these uh, similar hints, but our data is really definitive. If you look at it, it's interesting because during the day, during the time when the mouse is active, that's at night, all the gene expression is geared towards neuronal activity, you know, um, protein modification, um, you know, uh, actually active signaling related to neuronal function, like dopamine signaling. Meaning that during the time the mouse needs to walk around, running around, all the new, they're, they're, they're gearing towards make sure the neurons are working well. But then while they're asleep during the day, all those genes start quiet down. It's not completely gone, but they're just much lower. But then the genes start turning up are all related to metabolism, DNA repair, you know, cholesterol synthesis, so it's sort of the, the day repair job. You know, you can imagine this is almost like a plane, right? If the plane is in the air, you cannot go outside and try to like fix this or do things. You just need to make sure the plane is flying, everything's doing well, right? If you're walking around, you'll make sure you find food and avoid the, whatever animal try to eat you, right? So you're really geared towards that. But then when you're sleeping, right, when you're resting, the body starts detoxifying. You know, there's a lot of the data suggests there are these sort of metabolism, detoxification, repair your DNA, you know, so that you can ready for the next day. You see what I'm saying? So this really, and then there's a recent study, it's kind of crazy, showing Drosophila. You make the Drosophila, the fruit fly, not sleep for like three weeks, which is really bad. By the way, fly or, or human or animal, long-term not sleep, they always die, right? The big question is why? So they show that if they make fly not sleep for three weeks, there's high level of oxidative stress. Okay, they're basically they generating these reactive oxygen species. They stick with DNA, stick with lipid, the protein, and make the whole thing go sour. Okay, so, so that's sort of the, the you know, latest answer. But I really believe the idea of, you know, you divide up the task, right? So that you have like 12 hours of hard work and 12 hours of a rest. So your, your cell can repair whatever is damaged during the day, if you will. Okay. Interesting question, because you can ask me other questions if you want, but also a Huntington question, maybe. Um, I saw I was, so I'm like, I'm very interested by, by your fewer study, because Huntington's is a really interesting disease. So I was wondering if you have any advice for us when it comes to like choosing a field of research to work in for the rest of the life. Yeah. Oh, a field to work in for, for, College is it or a future? What like for research in general, yeah. Oh wow, that's a really big question. Because uh, I know many of you are interested in many different areas. Um, it's uh, as broad as it can be. Uh, but for those of you who has inclination for, you know, biology or medicine or uh, even um, computer science, I know AI is a big buzzword. Um, I really think neuroscience is a good area. The reason is that um, let me tell you so. When I first went to the Brain Initiative, so I actually was lucky enough to get one of the first to bring it around the Brain Initiative grants. I think there's only 59 uh, groups got it. So we went there. This is like a presidential project, right? Started by President, President Obama. So we went there. It's really gathering of not just the neuroscientists. Okay, there are people from like engineers. There's people from 
you know, um, you know, companies are doing AI and they're, you know, DARPA, ARPA, I mean, all these people are there. The reason is that it really, I think really, if you can understand the brain better, okay, number one, you know, uh, it, it help us to understand who we are, right? You know, I used to, I used to like to think almost any subjects of learning is related to neuroscience, right? Think about sociology, think about economics. Economics really just a human brain making decision, you know, on matter related to business. And um, if you learn the traditional economics, it says it's more kind of rational, but now we know the human economic decision is not rational. That's why there's a new field called the neuroeconomics, how we really make decisions. So, so the idea, and also uh, I really love the idea of uh, you know, computer science, right? You know, can, can enhance neuroscience research, which is true now. We're actually using all these high power computing, you know, using machine learning, all that. But then in the long run, the neuroscience can help inspire the next generation of computer science, right? I mean, there's no AI can do some of the simplest thing like you can do, you know, that a little baby can do, such as, you know, see what the next person gonna do to me. You know, so there are a lot of these, you know, uh, human brain can do with only, you know, two pounds of tissue and, uh, you know, probably 10, I don't know how many watts of energy, very little energy, I was told, and we, our brain never heat up. So all my computer scientists ask me, William, why the brain doesn't heat up? You know, my computer does much less computation and I need all these, uh, you know, cooling systems. So, so my, my point is that I think it's the future because they really can merge many different fields and, and then Next thing you know is the brain inspired, you know, computing or, you know, a lot of part of our brain function can be actually uh, done, yeah, done with computer. On the flip side, okay, those interesting computer science, a lot of them, once they've done that, they really try to, you know, um, help patients, right? There are people doing AI for medical, you know, image diagnosis. A friend of mine who's actually, uh, someone, actually someone I know who's a really good uh, uh, AI scientist, He's actually tried to develop, a, you know, AI tools to help Alzheimer patients, right? Help to, to see whether they're getting sick or not, or help them to do things that are much harder for them to do. So again, I think um, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a merge of different fields. I encourage many of you to not just go to one field, okay? Yes, you need to, you need to become expert on one field, but if you're interested in working at the edge, you know, between two fields, that's when the new thing's gonna come. Okay, so right now, you know, I collaborate with people who are from other fields. You know, I collaborate with people who are statisticians like Steve Horvath or with uh, Jason Tong, who's a computer scientist. But some of you, I think, I hope a lot of you who are actually going to, you're young, you know, you know what's important to actually going to take maybe two fields, learn, you know, deeply in two fields, and then all of a sudden, everything you think is unique and novel. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. You briefly brought up that um, people can also get Huntington's disease from a young age, and I was just wondering if the findings that you present here have generally been seen to apply to um, juvenile onset HD as well, or if like the underlying causes and pathology are a little bit different between those types. Really good question. Um, so actually juvenile Huntington patients usually onset less than 20 years old, usually like 2 to maybe 15. And um, they have a much longer repeat, usually 60 or longer. Um, so in patients, they, they actually present somewhat differently because they tend to have a more dystonia, okay, the more couldn't move. And also they tend to have a seizure, which you do not see in the older HD patient. However, we think they're the pathogenesis in the continuum. So we, we don't think the juvenile Huntington is completely different from adult onset, okay? Maybe juvenile Huntington somehow in, interact with the, the brain that's still developing in human because the human development takes a longer time. So, so we think they'd be more relevant. However, the, the good question here is that you, I thought you were asking, the repeated length we used in the mouse is very long. Okay, you probably know the shortest one I told is 97. All the other ones more than 100. So that is a enigma. It's just that in, in, in the mouse, if we, people made mouse model with only 50 Q. In human, that would be a Huntington disease. But in the mouse, there's just no disease at all. So for some reason, the mouse are more less sensitive, if you will, to the toxicity of the longer CAG, longer Q. So in the mouse model of, of all these CAG repeat disorders, we have to make it about 100 and longer to see anything, right? So you cannot build a model that's genetically so accurate, but there's no disease, then you cannot study anything. So we 
basically have to make it about 100 or a little bit longer. So we can see disease within a reasonable time frame. And, um, but you can use other ways to link the phenotype to the patients, right? Such as the progressive behavior deficit, it start off normal, and then it gradually gets sick, like shrinkage of the brain, the aggregates, the transcriptional changes, which I did not have time to go into, that are CAG lines dependent and striatal selective. So, so I think um, the last story short is that we use the juvenile repeat, but we think that the mechanism we're studying should apply to both juvenile and adult onset Huntington disease. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question. Hi, um, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I know you mentioned that it's really hard to like prevent or like slow down the progression of Huntington's disease. And I was just wondering what the biggest challenge would be in stopping the progression of the disease in patients. Yeah, really good question. Um, that's a really good question. So what I did not tell you is that, um, well, first of all, you know, we need to understand the mechanism of progression, right? So the progression for Huntington disease is about 20 years. The pro progression for Alzheimer's disease, interestingly, is about seven years, okay? So from onset, which is someone who mostly normal, without trained eye, you cannot tell they have disease. But then by the end of that progression, it will be a patient who cannot eat, cannot drink, you know, for Alzheimer's disease, do not even remember who their loved ones are, you know, which is really tough. Um, so, so that's a big, long time. And um, right now, we just don't understand very well yet what are the mechanisms. So that's number one. Number two is that um, the genetics we're studying, okay, this so-called genetic etiology, which is a great handle to start a study disease, right? Because you want to start somewhere. You don't want to like just start with some kind of toxin giving to mouse and all of a sudden the neuron in the striatum die. That's Huntington disease. For a long time, people do that. That's not Huntington disease. That's a toxin kill the neuron that's also dying Huntington disease. So, so the idea here is that um, the genetic study we have is mostly related to the etiology, the early part of the disease, okay? Only recently, the scientists are looking for genetics related to the progression. So I, what I did not tell you is that in Huntington disease, there's a big genetic study. We know the gene is caused by Huntington disease, but we also know there are so-called genetic modifiers. They make the onset a little bit early, a little bit late. You see that bigger window, you know, at the beginning, the repeat length. So their, their, their genetic modifier make the onset early. Their genetic modifier make the onset late, a couple of years, okay? They will get Huntington. But also their scientists now looking for genetic modifier for progression, for Huntington disease. Amazingly, what they found is actually genes involved in DNA repair. Almost every gene showed up is involved in DNA repair. And it's specifically the DNA repair that's modified the repeat length. So the Huntington repeat is not only they're very long, they actually get longer and longer as they ages. This so-called somatic repeat instability. So in, amazingly, they found is that these modified Huntington disease are a DNA repair enzyme that influence the repeat length. And they found actually in the patient, if you look at the age of onset, the repeat length, the CAG repeat length is much better predictor when they get disease, but not at the poly Q length. So there, there are actually patients with some CAA also has glutamine in the middle. And those actually, if you have CAA, it, the, 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 the total Q length is not a good predictor of age onset. The pure CAG is a good predictor of age onset. So for that reason, you know, I didn't have time, but I developed this new model called the back CAG where the back HD has a CAA, CAG in it. So back CAG is pure CAG in the whole Huntington. And interestingly, with the back CAG, we see something that back HD does not have. It, 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 does, it has this really selective striatal inclusions, this aggregation that only in the striatum, and this transcriptional change. So, so, so we think actually what the uninterrupted repeat is doing, which is most likely in DNA or RNA level, is actually driving this nuclear transcriptional change in the striatal neuron. So this is actually a study we're, we're, we're under review right now. Good question. So the idea is that we can, through genetic study, through more study, we should have new targets modify the progression. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much for your speech. It was really interesting to listen uh, to. And uh, my question is regarding your like the beginning of your talk. You mentioned that uh, Huntington disease is like one of the model diseases because it has like uh, I, I think 99% of like gen genetic uh, deter mm -hmm. determination and like uh, other diseases you uh, had shown on the slide on the slide they had 
uh, for example, like uh, lesser percentage of genetic impact. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I assume the rest is like environmental impact. And could you please elaborate on like how uh, the fact that uh, these other diseases have like more factors involving environment, like how, how does uh, their treatment, their like uh, research uh, vary because of that from Huntington diseases that is like mostly purely genetical? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, actually, uh, I might, I might, okay, I actually have it, have it here for you. So, so the idea here is the Huntington is purely genetic, right? But some other disease like Alzheimer's disease is, is not purely genetic. There's some Alzheimer's disease shown on the lower left here, they're purely genetic form. It's so-called the familial Alzheimer's disease. It's about 1% of Alzheimer patient has these mutations on the lower left, uh, upper left. And if you have them, just like Huntington, half the children will get Alzheimer's disease. But the most Alzheimer's disease, okay, most of the patients we all know are, you know, grandparents or people that you know, are actually, um, they, 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 they have an interaction with gene and environment, you're right. But more importantly is that even that's the case, we can still get it at the genetic, you know, risk factors or protective factors. So when we, what we do is, I actually might have a, Sorry, uh, I might have a, oh, I, here. So the way they study this is that they, they look at the lots and lots of Alzheimer patients, okay? You get like 10,000 or 100,000 of them, Alzheimer diagnosis, and then age-controlled people without Alzheimer disease, okay? Like another 100,000. And they're all unrelated, right? It's a big population. And then what you do is you just map through the whole genome. You look at the SNPs. There's a little variation between human beings. You don't care what, whether they are anything to do with Alzheimer or not. You just genotype each one of them for half a million or one million of these locations across the genome. And then after you're done, you ask which one of these locations are more in Alzheimer's disease or some of them may be fewer in Alzheimer's disease. So what I illustrate here is that if it's an asterisk of one of the SNPs showed up more in Alzheimer's disease, that means this, whatever this location, doesn't mean that SNP itself, but somewhere near it, okay, a gene near it, is actually increasing the Alzheimer's risk, okay? And then look at this asterisk here, it showed up much fewer in Alzheimer's disease than, than, the, than the other. That means whenever you have this, it's protective, right? If you have asked this. So, so scientists have done that. If you look at the right, upper right here, is that they've done that and they actually find out dozens of genes, okay? In related to Alzheimer's risk. And number one is APOE, okay, APOE4. And the number two is the TREM2, but there's all these little genes here too. And interestingly, almost all of them are involved in the function of this brain's immune cell. So my lab actually took some of these genes like TREM2. We showed that if you boost the dosage of TREM2, human TREM2 again is humanized, we can actually abolish a lot of the phenotype of Alzheimer's disease in these mouse models. So again, that is a way to get a genetic clue. In this case, it's not 100%. It's just a risk factor. To get a genetic clue from human, and then you study them in mouse models. Okay, good, very good question. I thought you were going to ask me what's the 1% of, you know, with a Huntington that's not a Huntington disease. Um, okay, I'll answer that for you anyway. So there actually turned out there's 1% people that showed up in the clinic, looks exactly like Huntington disease. The way they move, the way their symptom is. They said, do we have a parent acid? They said, yeah, yeah, we have a parent has the same symptom. They're like, this is Huntington disease. And then they go in and look for Huntington gene. There's no mutation. So it turned out there are two or three other genes, okay? that actually can cause Huntington symptom. One of them is also a CAG repeat expansion. It's called Huntington disease like two. And it's only in uh, South Africa and South America. Um, uh, sorry, in Africa and South America. And uh, it's in a different gene, okay? My lab actually made a mouse model for Huntington disease like two. And we understand, you know, what's going on in terms of pathogenesis. Anyway, no more self ask the questions. Uh, so you, you mentioned uh, sorry, so you mentioned in your talk that uh, the more uh, the gene was repeated, like the Q thing, the earlier the age of onset. Mm -hmm. So technically, if humans had a greater life expectancy, would it be possible for people with less than 36 Q repeats to get Huntington disease? That is a really good question. Um, 
So this is actually in generally true for all the neurodegenerative disease. Um, so, so, um, so for Huntington, you know, um, when the lifespan, let's just say 100 years ago is, you know, let's just say 50s, right? And then, so this actually is not, it's thought it was, was thought is not that common. But now the lifespan goes up to like, you know, 90, 80s or 90s. And interestingly, some of these patients without family history, okay, these are the patients with the repeat, like you said, between maybe 30 something and 40, for sure, between 35 and 40. Okay, those 35, 40, those people, they've died early, they didn't even show Huntington disease. But, but some of them now, actually between 30 and 35, they actually start showing symptoms of Huntington disease. There's one lady uh, actually um, was diagnosed, uh, you know, by Dr. Ann Yang, former chairman at the Mass General Hospital. She's like 90 some years old, diagnosed with Huntington disease, you know, and, um, and it's, it's because the repeat is very, you know, it's in that kind of a gray zone, and then they live long enough, so they show the symptom. So again, this highlight the key fact that I was mentioning to you too. I, I hope uh, could stimulate some of your imagination. Aging is not something that's not modifiable. You know, um, the people have now do this routinely in the small worm called C. elegans, and sometimes in Drosophila. And in, in mammals now, there's a really beautiful epigenetic marker uh, invented by Steve Horvath, my colleague and collaborator. And now we actually have developed yet unpublished a pan-mammalian marker. So we have a Gen genetic marker for aging for all the mammalian species, okay? So, so, so in, all the way to broadhead whales, supposedly live the longest, and about 100 species of bats, whatever. So long story short is that with this true biological marker of aging, you don't have to really exactly know the birth date, okay? You can actually see what is the biological age and how can you move older or younger. And if you really could hopefully make the, you know, human, not just live longer, but live healthier longer, this long health span, not just the life span. Um, then a lot of these neurodegenerative disease may not occur. You know, you may still have a clear mind. I mean, eventually we're all gonna die with something, you know, no, no human being known to live beyond 120, that's sort of the upper limit. Um, but, but, but on the other hand, you know, you can have a clear mind and, you know, certainly a lot of good can come from that. You talked a little bit about um, therapeutics and like testing in monkeys. And I was just wondering, like, at what point does a therapeutic move from animal testing to human testing? Like, what are the rigors or what are like the standards um, for experiments that move to um, human testing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so basically, um, you want to make sure, uh, number one, is that uh, your therapy is targeting what do you consider a critical uh, disease-related targets for disease mechanisms? In this case, it's very little dispute because it's Huntington, mutant Huntington is toxic, right? So you reduce it, it should be good. And that, or, you know, that landmark paper that by Tom Cleveland's lab are uh, working with uh, uh, um, actually Frank Bennett at the uh, IONIS, both of them are breakthrough prize winner. Um, they really show that they reduce mutant Huntington in three different mouse models, you know, mostly in back HE, but also two other models. There's a sustained benefit. So that is the mechanism side. Then what you need to do is you need to make sure it's, it's, uh, it's not toxic, okay? So you have to you know, look at the distribution of your, your drug, the way you deliver them. These are not small compounds. So they have to inject into the you know, intrathecal space. This is actually in the very lower spine. So they have to do this in large animals. So large animal meaning um, you know, non-human primates like monkey or sometimes people go to sheep you know, or pig or you know, mini pig, but mini pig is not mini, they could be 200 pounds. Um, and uh, they have to make sure the distribution is right. And then they, 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 they have to do lots, lots of study to make sure they're not toxic, okay? Not only the distribution is right, they can engage the targets in the brain, okay? And they need to make sure it's not toxic. So if there is toxicity, you don't want to kill one patient, right? Of course, any clinical trial has a risk, but, but you really want to make sure uh, you do as much as you can uh, to, to eliminate the risk factor. So once you've done all that, okay, and, and of course you have to have a, you know, a, a industrial, you know, setup to actually synthesize this. This is not easy, okay, to make this oligonucleotide, you know, in large quantity and purity that can be used in human is not a trivial task, okay. And so, so you did all that, and then you go to FDA to convince them. Right, you have all these packages. So a big part of those F F FDA package is actually in the mouse model. So if you look at that New England Journal of Medicine paper, look at the supplement, it's all these things they did in, in, in the mouse model to show the 
you know, pharmacokinetics, the pharmacodynamics, how, what's the dosing, why we decide one month versus two months each dose. So there's just a lot of thoughts go into it. So there's a lot of uh, medicinal chemistry, you know, and then you, you go to clinic, you, you, you work with doctors. So I, for those of you who are interested to be a physician, uh, I highly, highly encourage you to do MD, PhD. Okay, like I did, I really think if you want to do uh, biomedical research, uh, I really think there's nothing better to be actually on both sides, right? You know the medicine and you know the research and you actually can bridge all the way like what we're doing in, you know, uh, preclinical side, also to the clinical side. You know, I'll be feel very comfortable to go to a drug company and just run their degeneration program. You know, so, so I really, I, I think, uh, you know, if you know both, know both sides, that's important. So you can design the clinical trial. When they do clinical trial, they're doing a very safe way. The phase one is very few patients. Or no, actually, normally it's human, normal human. In this case, they did in Huntington patient. But normally phase one, just a volunteer, young and healthy, and um, they give very low dose, you know, see what happens. So they don't even look for disease target, whatever. The phase two and phase three is when they really do, you know, bigger and bigger patient population, and they do like randomized case and control, right? So you give them some of them, you know, ASO, and others just inject saline, you know, and then see if you can see a difference in clinical outcome. Okay, so it's a really uh, long process, but it's very safe. And if it works, it, it, it could be, you know, groundbreaking, so. Uh, hi, Dr. Yang, thank you for your lecture. Um, I'm actually from RSI 18, and I have a question um, for you regarding neurodegenerative diseases. So I understand that there's been quite a lot of talk about how prion diseases are linked to neurodegenerative diseases because of uh, the fact that how as you mentioned just now, the common pathological features of neurodegenerative diseases are the aggregation of disease proteins. So how do you think prion diseases might be linked to such neurodegenerative diseases? Yeah, yeah, no, that's, a, that's also a really good question. Prion disease is one of the neurodegenerative diseases. So the only difference is of prion disease and these other diseases, the prion Usually, I mean, there are two different forms. There's some genetic form, you know, there are people who have a sort of genetic mutation uh, that can cause kind of prion-like disease. But the traditional prion disease is, is actually, uh, I think uh, some of you know, this actually could, could be due to the ingestion of, of, a, of a brain tissue, okay? Sometimes other human brain tissue in this, um, you know, um, New Guinea, I think Papua New Guinea, they got this tradition. So when, they, when you inject some of these protein, and these protein actually, are misfolded, okay? So there are protein that's normally folded, like good looking normal protein, and there's protein of this uh, called a prion protein, PR, whatever, it can misfold it. And once it's misfolded, it can actually almost act like a copy. It can convert others to be like the other prion protein. So prion protein has an important function in the brain. So when, when you have this prion protein, even inject into the blood, it will actually get into the brain and convert other protein into these aggregates. So the prion protein also eventually form aggregates, okay? So the only difference is, is that these, you know, Huntington is purely genetic, Alzheimer, Parkinson's genetic and environment, and the prion disease are because of, you know, these uh, preformed, you know, aggregated prion proteins that become quote unquote infectious. Okay, this is Stanley Prusner's, uh, you know, Nobel Prize. So, so all these are neurodegenerative disease. What I try to actually also convey to you, because some of you may not be, it, as interested in neurodegenerative disease, you may be interested in autism or schizophrenia, psychiatric disease. I think the question is the same. The question is that you, you know, all these other diseases also have some genetic, you know, uh, uh, sort of a linkage, right? Like a risk factor. We actually study a few of these genes in our lab. So they have a genetic risk factor, but they really manifest through the complexity called the human brain. You, well, I just want you to know that it's a really, you know, you know important you know, a mission, right? Because we're trying to save lives here. But meanwhile, it's also a really exciting journey because we try to understand something that's most complex in the universe. Same time, because we need both. If we don't understand the brain, we cannot treat it. I mean, we, we may came up with therapy, you know, uh, you know, using the strategy I told you. But, but by and large, I think a lot more therapy will come out once we really understand how the brain works. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Okay, um, I think 
if there's no more bring more question, no more question, I think it's kind of late for you guys. Maybe we'll <laughs> wrap up here. And we can uh, wrap wish up. the best of luck for all of you and uh, really enjoying RSI. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Yeah.